Um, we, we wanted to do something a bit different in this session. Um, we've had many great panel discussions, and it's great to hear from so many different stakeholders in the carbon market. But we all know that closing a transaction, getting, getting a deal done is always so much harder. Every project's different, every situation's different, and nice sentiments and positive thoughts can often start to unravel when it comes to looking at specific transactions. So we thought it was important to actually drill down into a live case study, talk about what it's like actually on the ground trying to raise finance. So uh, to that end, I'm really glad that our client, Brian, from Glanris agreed to join us on stage and to talk Absolutely. about this particular company. Now, when I asked Brian if he would uh, speak on stage with me at a fireside conversation, he said, Will, I'd love to, but fireside at a carbon conference? You may need to change your branding there. But even though we didn't, Brian, I'm glad to say you still joined us. So thank you very much for that. Well, I, I wore the sweater for the fireside chat here. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, Brian, how about you kick off by giving the audience an overview about Clannerus, who you are and what you do? Okay, sure. I um, assume most of you have probably not heard of our company. So, we were started in 2019 um, by uh, really taking some research that had been done at a local university in Memphis, Tennessee. We're based in Memphis, Tennessee by some environmental engineers who were asked the question, what can we do with all the ag waste across the river in Arkansas? And being environmental engineers, they thought about activated carbon and how you could carbonize a lot of this uh, plant waste material. So they set about looking at uh, about four different uh, plant waste materials and ultimately settled on rice hulls because it turns out that uh, rice hulls have some unique chemistry that can be leveraged in uh, the process to create an activated carbon, which removes organic contaminants. That's what activated carbons do, but also had some enhanced cationic functionality to remove heavy metals. So that was really our initial focus, was really looking at uh, creating a material to be a replacement in the water filtration market. And um, so as we started to gear up, launching this in November of 2019, went out to raise money in March of 2020, which was a great time to be raising money uh, as the world was shutting down. Uh, but ultimately, we're able to do that, um, and and uh, but couldn't really visit a lot of water filtration places uh, because they were closed down or not allowing people in. So we 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 really had to wait a bit before we could really pursue that market. Once we pursued that market, what we found is it's very slow uh, to adopt to new technologies, and and we did a, a little bit of a pivot then to start to take a look at, well, what else can we do with this uh, rice hull biochar? Um, and, and how do we really, you know, take, how can we really take this thing to, uh, to market? And, uh, and that's when we really sort of hit upon, and we'll talk a little bit about this in some later questions, uh, kind of the direction that we're headed in right now, which is um, really to, to be uh, a biochar provider that sells a product, um, but that also creates carbon credits during the process, and also to create electricity. That was really the, those three legs of the stool were critical for us, um, both to get finance, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, but, but also really to, to sort of shore up the diversity of revenue needed to kind of crack this market. Yeah. That's great, Brian. So um, we're going to drill down into the details of your journey in raising institutional financing and, of course, very biochar specific. I think just before we do that, it might be worthwhile to spend a couple of minutes just from your perspective, providing an overview of how you see biochar fitting into the broader CDR pathway. Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, that's, that's an hour-long conversation in and of itself. Um, uh, obviously, I'm pretty biased about biochar. Uh, I, I like this. I like it um, for a number of reasons, and, and some of them we, we touched on. 
you know, the, the first is that we're in this process, we're taking an ag waste material, which has historically been burned or left to rot, both of which produce greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide or methane. Um, and this, is, this has been the pathway for 10,000 years on what to do with ag waste. So we're taking that ag waste and we're converting it through a process known as pyrolysis into a carbon uh, that ultimately uh, will stay in that carbon form for thousands of years. So, you know, that in and of itself is great because we're, we're, we're addressing some issues, obviously, in climate change by being able to take this carbon out of the carbon cycle uh, and freeze it in, in stable carbon, which then uh, ultimately has these other applications. And, you know, it's not just water filtration or soil amendment. I mean, the International Biochar Initiative is studying over five dozen different applications for biochar. Because at the end of the day, what are you creating? You're creating carbon. Well, what can you do with carbon? Well, carbon's one of the handful of building blocks of everything on this planet, so there's a lot you can do with carbon. It really just depends upon, you know, what is the feedstock you're using, what is the chemical composition in that feedstock, and then how does that ultimately translate into the biochar, because each one of these is going to give you slightly different properties, which can open up the door for slightly different applications, or in some cases, very diverse applications, going from water filtration all the way through to creating plastics, to replacing cement in concrete, uh, in asphalt. Uh, we've even done some stuff with a tire company to replace uh, carbon black and silica and tire production. And there's a lot of applications out there. Um, and so that's pretty cool. You know, you, 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 you're addressing climate change and you're helping to produce a product which can then also help to decarbonize these other hard to decarbonize industries where you're really tackling their scope two and scope three uh, emissions. And then I think lastly, the other thing that I really like about biochar, and it, we, we were sort of late to the party, but um, ultimately what you're doing with, um, uh, with this excess heat that's required to carbonize this material uh, is critical. And, and when you start producing electricity from that, now you're producing a renewable uh, uh, electricity generation and you're doing it in uh, a distributed fashion, typically. It's not one big plant feeding the grid, but typically it's smaller plants that are more regional or even localized in nature. So, you know, with, with, with biochar, you get this sort of trifecta of, you know, helping to address climate change, helping to decarbonize other hard to decarbonize industries, and you're generating electricity. And you're doing that um, uh, today because this is a technology that is ready to scale today. It's shovel ready today. It's very low cost. So, and again, not to pick on, on DAC, but you know, when you compare that to other carbon removal technologies uh, and approaches like direct air capture, and again, I'm, I'm a fan of everything in carbon capture. So not, not to pick on any one, but, um, but just to, to, to compare it, I mean, there, you know, look at the cost uh, associated with that. I mean, you're, you're talking about an order of magnitude difference between, you know, something that today's $1,000 that may get down to $150, but we're there today. Um, you're looking at a product that doesn't produce any other products downstream. We help to produce other products that decarbonize other industries. And we're producing electricity, whereas DAC requires a lot of electricity. So I think there's a lot to love about biochar uh, as a technology and as approach to, uh, uh, to, to carbon sequestration. Yeah, that's great, Brian. Very um, comprehensive. And just to add um, maybe a bit of the overlay from the flow carbon perspective. Um, as we've heard today, flow carbon is focused on trying to help CDR project developers raise project finance. All projects, all pathways, as Brian was saying, was important for sure. But the subset of them where we can at least, as project finance bankers, can bring our experience helping to raise 
non-dilutive capital is, 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 is a bit more limited. So we need to be careful in choosing the ones where, where we can add value. And um, many of the points Brian raised around biochar aid the ability for us to raise institutional capital. So being shovel ready, as um, Brian said, I think I heard on one of the previous panels, someone said that institutional investors don't like to fund what are essentially test tube experiments. You know, pyrolysis is a technique has been around for a huge length of time, so that's great. Um, Brian also touched on the multiple revenue streams. Um, the unfortunate reality with a lot of other CDR pathways is they only have one revenue stream, that is carbon credits. And we all wish there was more buyers in the market. We're grateful for the buyers that are there, but one of the great things about biochar is we can construct financing packages around cash flows that aren't credits. So maybe there's not an offtake for the credits, but there can be an offtake for the physical biochar, the green power, et cetera. And we can structure deals that way. Um, it's got a hard asset underlying as well. A lot of the investors we work with, infrastructure investors, private credit funds, they don't want the project to go wrong. Of course, they don't think it will, but it's important to consider what happens if it does. Well, at least in the case of biochar, you've got an asset, there's an asset underlying, you can try and sell it. Again, no one wants to be in that situation, but you've got some semblance of recourse. Um, in many other CDR pathways, it's, it's not the case. So it, it's anyway why we at Flow Carbon spend a lot of time on biochar. It's not to say all biochar projects are financeable, but we have a higher strike rate of finding fat patterns within biochar developer projects that make it easier for us to raise finance. So, um, so we're excited about that space. Um, just before we delve into some of the details, Brian, of your financing, um, could you give a quick overview for the audience of how Glanorous has been financed to date and a quick overview of the financing that you're currently working on putting in place? Uh, sure. So I, I think like a lot of companies, we, as we were getting started, um, we, we looked locally. Uh, so our, our initial um, safe and then uh, seed round uh, was done with a combination of different partners. Uh, as I mentioned early on, um, we use rice hulls as our initial feedstock. Uh, and uh, across the river in Arkansas is where 55% of the rice in the United States is grown, and they generate um, almost 2 million tons of rice hulls a year that they're struggling to figure out what to do with. So we obviously went and talked to those players in Riceland Foods, which is one of the larger rice companies, uh, came in as, as a partner in that. Um, and then, uh, as we weren't at that time really focused on the carbon credit uh, aspects, but the water aspects, water filtration aspects of it, and the uh, technology that we had there, um, we talked to a number of people who had a focus around uh, the water market uh, and to local angel uh, investors. And uh, in, in Memphis, we're lucky to have an, an angel community that is... Uh, fairly active. Um, there's a lot of uh, ag wealth in that community, and they were certainly interested in a technology that could take some of these uh, ag issues and uh, and turn it into something more productive. So initially, we went down the route of look, looking for uh, corporate uh, partners as well as uh, local angel investors, uh, sort of high net worth family office investors. Great, right, thank you. Um, and um, do you want to maybe give a quick overview or an introduction to the financing that we're working on now? And we'll delve into details of what makes it financeable and how we're going to get there, but just set the scene in terms of moving from um, local <coughs> angels, VCs, startup capital, people with vested relationships and who you are in the business to something more institutional. How do you think when you look at that more longer term, certainly larger scale, longer dated institutional financing package? Sure. So it, it, when, we, when we first did this, you know, our, our thought was that this was, this was a straight equity investment. This, is, this would always be uh, we'd be looking for equity investors. And some of that is my background. I, 
you know, I, I came out of a, a, a wireless technology background, and everything that we'd ever done uh, in the technology that we we're developing uh, was through equity investment. So we hadn't really done project financing before. That was an area that was very new to me. Um, and as we started to look to scale up, uh, we, we started to run into a bunch of issues. And one of the issues was that when you go out and talk to a lot of these carbon, um, you know, a lot of these venture funds that have popped up that are addressing, you know, climate removal, I mean, climate uh, uh, tech issues and, and are really trying to address carbon removal and all that, a lot of these folks came out of um, software backgrounds. And, and so when you start talking to them about something that's very capital intensive, uh, you know, that, that wasn't a model that they were comfortable with. And so the, uh, our approach of talking to, you know, I mean, I think we talked to 70 or so different uh, uh, climate tech funds, um, they all sort of started to break out in a rash when they looked at the, um, at the amount of capital that was going to be required. And I'm still here trying to pitch them on, well, look, hey, this machine is equivalent to five of your software engineers. And our machine doesn't walk out the door every night, doesn't go talk to the competition, doesn't leave and go start its own business. It's still going to be there, and it's going to be a valuable asset. Um, but that, those, those words really uh, fell on deaf ears, I'm afraid. Funny that. <laughs> and, and so that's, the, you know, that's why as we started to look at this, we had to sort of rethink the approach. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the first group that we went out to talk to about project finance said, well, we love this. This is great. Um, we, we'd love to do this, and kind of here's our deal. Uh, we'll give you all the money you need. Uh, we'll own all the equipment. We'll own the building. We'll, we'll own everything. Um, once we get our money back plus a 30% return on our money, uh, well, then we'll start to let you guys have a, a piece of it. And we'll start with you guys can get 10% of the cash flows from that. And then, you know, as we, as we scale up, you know, we can get to 40%, then maybe we can give you 20% returns. And I was a little confused because that didn't sound like a very good deal to me um, as, as somebody who, you know, was really taking really looking for the upside on the equity here, why would I take away all of the future cash flow, which was, you know, going to, to help us create value in the company? Um, so we said no to, to, to those guys. But uh, as we started to look at, at that model, I mean, while that might have been a bit egregious, you know, there are ways to come back and, and do a deal in that project finance space. But what you have to have in order to be able to, to do a deal that makes sense is you have to have the revenues locked down. And that's really the biggest problem um, for a pure biochar play is that biochar today, there aren't many big offtake agreements in, in biochar. Um, while we have applications that we're pursuing with major universities and other big corporate partners in some unique vertical markets that have the potential to grow to large volume, these are, as the last panel indicated, these are science projects today. Um, there are a few that aren't. Uh, certainly the water filtration's not. We've got patents and deployments in that, but that's a slow-moving market with long sales cycles, and, and they don't do um, offtake agreements. When they need it, they buy it. When they don't need it, they don't buy it. They, don't, they, they will store and stock some inventory, but it's minimal inventory. So, uh, you know, really that's what led us to really start to take a look at the energy generation uh, and to try to see if we could get there on the energy generation side. Uh, and, and that was interesting in Tennessee because TVA is not very interested in, uh, in power purchase agreements, green power purchase agreements, because they don't have to be. They consider themselves largely a green power producer because of the hydro and nuclear that they're doing. Uh, so if you could get a power purchase agreement, it would be for 1.9 cents a kilowatt hour. 
Meanwhile, in California, who is a lot more, they're a lot more desperate for uh, energy, particularly renewable energy generation in California. PG&E and their biomat programs paying 19 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Well, you know, 10 times. So now it starts to get interesting when you do the math on the project because there you can get 20 year offtake agreements and you get these things locked in and they're bankable. But for you know, a lot of the biochar, it's hard to find those big applications, except in ag. And in ag, there are not a lot of these same kind of offtake agreements. You know, you, you're not lining up your, um, you're not doing seed contracts for 20 years to commit to buying a certain number of seeds. It's just not the way they do it. It's year to year. Uh, you look at what you need, you look at what happened last year, you think about what you're going to do. And so if you go out there and try to raise money around or try to get the offtake agreements around an ag deal, it's very hard. Now, we, we were successful in that, um, not for a 20-year agreement, but a five-year agreement because uh, the partner that we're working with, A, has a lot of land under management. So he, he's got a place to put it. Um, and, and B, California, um, under the NRCS program, which is a government program that's paying farmers to put down biochar, not, not just biochar by itself, but as part of an overall program uh, to help to address the soil carbon issues, uh, and they will pay farmers to uh, a pretty good amount of money in California to apply biochar, and particularly biochar that's been inoculated with you know, other manure or mixed with compost or, or whatever. So you know, now, finally, for us, uh, we have you know, long-term power purchase agreements that, uh, that can satisfy some of the debt components we need. Um, and and I, I sort of now learned a new term, debt service coverage ratio. Well done. Uh, yeah. 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 And um, so I've kind of figured that out. And so that helps us to get to a certain amount of debt. And then with the addition of the, uh, the biochar offtake, you know, we're, we're sort of there to get to a debt level that, we, that can support um, our deployment of this along with a little bit of equity. And, and the equity is important for us as well. Yeah, that's, that's uh, brilliant, Brian. You covered so, so many points there. Um, that was that's fantastic. So, yeah, when, when we think about the state we want to get to in project finance, like what are we aiming for? It, it may be tricky today, but what are we trying to get for? As Brian says, capital intensive projects, equity, VC, diluting yourself and your business only gets you so far. Where are we trying to get to? We're trying to get to debt. We're trying to get to relatively leveraged capital structures on safe projects that are de-risked, have been done before, you want to raise as much debt as possible. With debt, you can put in place fairly large amounts. It can give you tenor. It's non-dilutive. It can be non-recourse, et cetera, et cetera. So how if you think like wind, solar, some battery storage, how this is financed? So we're trying to replicate that in, in, uh, in, 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 in this space. So how do we go about doing that and what needs to be in place for that? debt to come into the transaction. Like it's, it's a great thing. It's, it's long tenor, it's large amounts, it's non-dilute, et cetera, et cetera. It, it all sounds great. It's a great thing to have, but the bar is necessarily quite high. So, you know, I think it's testament to the length of what I tried to tee Brian up for a short question with a short answer. I actually got a very long answer because there's so much to it and so much needs to be done. And Brian was just rattling through, I'm sure, memories of all the conversations we've had. So um, maybe I'll try and break it down into two areas to slightly oversimplify it. But you've got the construction side of it. Is what you say you're going to do going to get built? And is it going to work? We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But that's obviously a key component. The other part which Brian was talking about was revenue certainty. Assuming what you said you're going to build, you can be built and you can operate it, how do we know those cash flows are going to come in? So. Brian talked about the three revenue streams he has on his, on his transaction. Um, every biochar project's different, but what we liked about Brian's project is three sources of revenues. So sales of physical biochar, sale of the green electricity that he generates, and also the credits. So how much of that can we fix? How much can we get subject to offtake? 
And when we talk about offtake, we're just saying a counterparty agrees to buy a fixed amount of that revenue at a fixed price. So it's not variable, it's not linked to an index, it's not, yeah, I'll buy it, but price TBC, no, no. You've committed in advance, fixed price, fixed volume. So as Brian talked through, um, he's been successful in securing that on the power. So he's got a power purchase agreement in place in California where the project's located, which is great. Also on the physical char itself, has an offtake in place for many, many years, fixed price, fixed volume, which is fantastic. But as of today, not on the, not on the credits. But that was fine, that, that is fine. We have enough certainty on the two thirds, as it were, of the revenues, that's enough to cover debt service. So it's the lenders are most concerned about this. They're less able to take a view, you know, they're only getting a fixed interest rate, even if the project does specifically well, really well, smashes it, they're still earning their fixed interest rates. They don't get any of the upside. So correspondingly, they're very worried about, uh, about the downside. So Brian and his team did a fantastic job securing those. And, um, and, and it's hard, like, you know, we speak to biochar developers day in, day out. And I wanna say particularly on the physical biochar, like we've all seen the USBI, IBI presentations. We see huge caggers for how big the biochar market's gonna be. It can get used in everything. It makes everything better, it's fantastic. And it's, it's all great, but who's buying it today? in material volume, what's more, who's signing contracts to agree to buy a fixed volume at a fixed price for a number of years? Very, very few people. And one of the reasons why we focus on biochar projects in North America is what Brian was saying. The NRCS 336 gives direct compensation to farmers under a variety of circumstances to put biochar in their soil. So we thought, okay, great. Farmers are getting paid to put it in the soil. Surely it must be easy. It's not that you have to convince them it's a good deal or not. They're getting paid to do it. No, it's still really, really, really hard to do. But um, Brian and his team have, have actually managed it. And I want to talk about the, the power part, and Brian referenced it, saying where you can sell um, the price of power up in California. You know, it's not the case where Brian's from. Where the pilot facility is operated, price of power, you know, in the southern states, it's, it's kind of almost free. So you can put in place a PPA, but there's very little economics coming back from it. So location of biochar project, yeah, we all talk about feedstock, access to feedstock, and of course that's critically important, but if you're generating power, it depends where you're located, not just which country, like which part of which country, who are you signing power offtake agreements with and, 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 and at what price? So, so critically important. But um, one final point is that it's not the all revenues need to be locked. It's not that every single future dollar you're gonna make from the project needs to be subject to fixed price, fixed volume offtake, but a sufficient amount needs to be to cover debt service, and as Doug Bryan said, to get the DSCR, the debt service cover ratios required by the lender. Every buy charge is different. Every project finance debt lender we work with is different, but it's critical that a sufficient amount of the revenues is locked to cover debt service. So, so that, that's the, that's the revenue side of it. And then the other side of it is construction. Just because you say you're gonna build it, how do we know you can build it? Now, um, from our seat and what, what we see, um, really see biochar developers dividing into two. There's the half who are buying off the shelf equipment. Maybe there's modifications to it, but they're buying from a third party vendor who creates pyrolysis equipment. That has the advantage of There'll be other units in operation, hopefully using the same type of, type of feedstock. We can look, look at runtime data there. We have confidence to know that as long as they can operate it, 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 it should work well. Then there's the other set of biochar developers who work with who are trying to design their own kit. Now, that's always harder because we can't look at as easily to historical precedent. They're building it for themselves, but it's actually essential in this space because unfortunately, a lot of the pyrolysis units available commercially, quote unquote, off the shelf, don't operate at particularly large throughputs. So we champion and we support all the developers who are looking to build their own kit, working with tech providers looking to put new things on the market that can really scale up. Obviously harder from the construction sides, but critically important. Um, Any Brian, tell us about your journey on choice of pyrolysis provider and how you saw that journey play out? Um, yeah, sure. So we, when, we, when we initially started this, 
um, in, in a very small lab scale environment, uh, we, we were doing this with a, in a batch process. Uh, and obviously batch processes are hard to scale. Uh, so as we were ramping up um, in, our, in our Memphis facility uh, and started to go out and look at kilns, we, we looked at a lot of different kilns. Um, we looked at you know, the, the, the European guys, uh, we looked at the Chinese guys, we looked at big, small, everything in between. And, and you know, what, what we sort of saw in that market was, um, and again, not, not to pick on any, any one provider, is that, you know, the, the European guys had very well engineered, beautifully designed uh, equipment. I mean, you know, these were the Mercedes Mob X of that, that kind of world. But, you know, what we really needed was, you know, an F-150 pickup truck. And, and so we, we started looking, well, where, where can we find that? Um, we, we talked here in the United States to people that make rotary kilns for uh, chemical applications. And, um, and ultimately found somebody that was doing waste energy and really wanted to get into and integrate a kiln into that process so that they could create biochar and generate electricity. Small manufacturer um, uh, based out of Canada uh, who was you know, coming into the United States and really wanted to get aggressive in the United States. So we actually worked with them um, during the lockdown uh, when we couldn't go out and visit customers on what does this technology need to look like. Uh, and we, we made a couple of decisions, which, which we obviously like, because um, we made them, um, but they, they really helped to produce a very low cost, very efficient machine. So what we ended up with is something that's known as a uh, direct fire, counter flow, rotating pyrolysis machine. And the, um, they're, they're, that we were the first ones to really do that in this scale. And the, the neat thing about that machine is that, uh, that, you know, unlike a lot of the other ones which were focused on capturing bio oils and, and all of these uh, other um, uh, syn gases and biofuels that are coming off of the woodstock, we burn that inside the kiln. The advantage of doing that is really threefold. N number one, it reduces the thermal input required to heat the kiln to the temperature that you need for pyrolysis. Number two, the way we burn it, and it's a, there's some particular design here, um, uh, we control the flow of the oxygen so that only enough oxygen to burn the biofuels and syngases goes in. What that means is that combustion of those materials creates an anaerobic environment at the bottom of the kiln, which is where our biochar is. So, uh, and, and thirdly, it burns up the particulates. So you have a very clean uh, exhaust on this. And, and nobody else had, the, had that technology, and we still don't see other people with, with that approach. Um, and, and for us, some of that was really driven out of necessity because rice hulls, which is our initial feedstock, was very low in oils. So, you know, to get, to try to produce biofuels out of that was a real long run for a short slide. And it, it wasn't much there. And it was very expensive to do that right. And now, we did kick around with that technology with another manufacturer for about six months, but it's, it's dirty, it's messy, it's, it, you gotta be, you gotta really know what you're doing there in order to get those fuels, produce them, and then be able to ship them and make money on it. And, and we just thought, well, you know, that, that's, that's not something that we want to focus on. Um, so, you know, now uh, we, we have a machine that we really like. Um, we're, we're scaling that up for the facility that we're in right now. Um, in, and we've created a partnership with our technology provider where we have some exclusive rights in certain markets with that, uh, with that machine. Um, and frankly, we've been very helpful uh, to them in helping to sell that to other people. 
Um, a, because we want lots of other biochar providers out there, and, and B, because we think it's, it's a great technology for medium-sized producers. And, you know, part of the, the issue that we're about to face as, as we really scale up, and there are a number of them, is, you know, we've got to move from something that's capable of doing one ton an hour to ultimately equipment that's capable of doing 25 tons an hour. Um, now, that's a big step, and, and, you know, our technology provider doesn't have that. Frankly, no biochar providers out there have that. It's going to require um, a big development effort, uh, which is going to require dollars, obviously, to, to do that. And none of the biochar guys are really in a position today to do that kind of technology development. So ultimately what we're doing is we're going to have a bunch of these machines yeah, uh, sure. and, and you know, we'll have those lined up, which is okay for us uh, in that it's going to give us some diversity of, uh, of plant, which means if one machine breaks down, we've got two others behind it uh, you know, to, to support it. Um, but ultimately, we and other biochar folks have to come together and look at uh, what's it going to take for us to scale this up? Because you, 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 you're going to have to both scale up the technology side of the equation as well as scale up the application side. Because ag and, and that market is only going to get us so far. Um, you know, the feedstock will support gigaton production but the, um, that's not going to go in exclusively into agriculture. Uh, it's, you're going to have to build these other markets, which is why we've been you know, working with a number of universities and others uh, around the country on applications in cement, and, and you know, we could go on. Um, but you know, they're, they're all listed there in the IBI um, uh, website on the things that they're looking at. A handful of those are the ones that we're focused on that have the potential to, um, you know, to really ramp up. Yeah, that's great. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting, even though I would put you in the category of off the shelf, that's probably the wrong phrase, but there's a third party vendor of pyrolysis equipment who is providing it elsewhere to other biochar developers. It's still very clear as you speak, it's a partnership between you and that provider. Um, these aren't truly commoditized machines. It's not like we're building a wind farm and there's all the conventional providers we can go to. It's still your working with that provider to get the right pyrolysis kit that works for you. And um, I was hearing as you were speaking about how it's beneficial for everyone, and I'm sure you would be happily telling the other biochar developers in the room who the provider is, because it, it, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Like, if you're all helping these developers to produce more kit and have it across more sites, it easy, gets easier for the industry, and particularly for financiers, because they can say, okay, I've seen this kit provider operate before, it was different feedstock, maybe different country, but we know their kit operates well. Um, just to add another part to that, the financing overlay, if you can, if you sort of always bring it back, considering a conventional wind farm, you may have heard of EPCs, engineering procurement construction agreements, really the bedrock of large debt financings for mega infrastructure projects. This is to say that there is a third party contractor who really stands behind puts their name behind, puts their balance sheet behind the construction of the projects and guarantees that it will be installed on time and on budget and it will operate. Now, this is the thing of wind farms. It's absolutely not the thing of this space, as you can hear from everything that we've said. Um, but convincing project finance lenders to come into biochar, uh, we're always going to be focusing on the lenders who are more risk tolerant, so higher interest rate than conventional lenders going into wind farms, certainly not banks. You know, we're talking private credit funds. They, they still need something, you know, for Brian to say, oh, it's fine, I can do this, don't worry. You know, it's like, okay, well, we're, sure you, you know, we're pretty convinced you will. We've seen the track record, we've seen the pilot facility, but um, for those of you who've worked on project finance deals, I'm sure you can empathize, it's, it's, it's generally 200 contracts, it's documents, documents, documents. There is always third party stakeholders, insurance provider, guarantors, etc. So lenders are just used to this, that they won't demand a full EPC, it's not possible anyway, but 
we found that just having something there can, can help. So on the transaction, working on with Brian, it's been important for the lender there to have a third party insurance provider that they're by no means expert in biochar, who is, um, they're not exactly that many large projects, but they're willing to provide some risk mitigation. Will they cover all risks and all situations, guarantee full name capacity? Obviously not. Will they put their balance sheet behind it to a certain extent in certain situations? Yes. And it's just getting that balance right, trying to make the transaction look as close as possible to a conventional wind farm transaction, but making it realistic within the context of, 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 of carbon. And we see this deal structuring as necessary as a requirement to get these first-footed institutional lenders to come into the space. We all hope in five years' time, people like Brian, well, Brian himself has done multiple projects, other people like Brian have done lots of projects. There's many examples of these projects getting off the ground easily, and then commercial lenders are coming in and lending huge amounts of money at cheap interest rates. So we're all up for that, and we all look forward to that day. But this is about these, these, these first steps, moving from equity, moving from VC dollars into non-dilutive debt capital. But giving the lenders comfort that they're not taking equity risk, but pricing it as debt. So that, that's the journey, that's the process that we've been through with Brian, and every biochar developer is different. You know, I'm sure there's many developers in the room are thinking, well, all I've got is carbon credits, and we've got a Microsoft offtake, and you know, there's always different ways of doing it. That There's no right or wrong, but always trying to get down to the fundamentals of a fundamentally de-risk project, so investors feel comfortable coming in and knowing there's a high chance the developer is going to do exactly what they say that they're going to do. But um, yeah, that was great insight there, Brian. Um, we, we do want to make this um, interactive. I've got a lot more questions. I can keep going with Brian. We could probably keep going for two hours. But I do want to open up. If anyone's got any questions, however specific and detailed, please put your hands up. Feel free to shout. If not, I'll continue. But I did want to give this opportunity right now, just before I continue, otherwise. Sure. Actually, do you want to wait for, um, we can get you a microphone, I think, can we? Thank you. Um, this question is more so for the applicable use of biochar. And so in your experience, have you noticed that clientels are more intrigued and interested in using biochar as a form of alternative fuel or energy or more so as kind of like an additive in the built environment um, section of that business? Yeah, yeah uh, great, great question. I mean, you know, as I said before, what is biochar? It's carbon, right? So it's it's basically charcoal. So you could burn it if you wanted to. Um, we and there are applications. We we've seen this from some steel producers that are looking for low carbon fuels. They want to stop burning. Um, they want to stop burning what they're burning and burn a low carbon fuel. We we've stayed away from that. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons on, on that end, because A, what they're paying is not very exciting, and, and B, it defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing. Uh, is if we're going to go through all this effort to you know, sequester that carbon, why would we want to burn it? Um, so we, we've said no to, to those guys. The, the attraction there is that, that those are huge markets, and you could sell a lot of tonnage into that market. Now, the other side of the steel um, uh, equation is people that are actually using this in the steel production process. Um, and there, you know, the, the, um, the, you, you are still retaining some of the carbon uh, and, and it can be sequestered. Lots of discussions about what percentage that is, but it really does affect your, your carbon credits. Um, we, we've sort of stayed away from that, um, but as that Tech, production technology comes along and more of that carbon can be integrated into the steel uh, and less of it gets burnt, um, then that, that might be interesting. A, because they, they pay a lot more for it, I'm talking $750 to in some cases some bids that we've had from other people up to $1,000 a ton. Well, that, that could be attractive, right? Because if we're, if we're selling it into the ag space for $300 a ton and getting $200 carbon credits or $150 carbon credits versus selling it for $1,000 in, 
into the steel industry and getting zero carbon credits, well, the mass says sell it in the steel industry. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sort of keeping a watch on that right now. Um, the, the ideal for us is, you know, to have our cake and eat it too, which is to find the applications like water filtration where, you know, you, you get paid a premium for that product uh, and it sequesters carbon and it ultimately, you know, won't get burnt or, or reused. So, um, so, you know, that's, I think, the, that's where we'd like to head over looking at some of these other uh, technologies or approaches. That's great, thank you. Any other, any other questions? Thank you. Thanks very much. And just to say it's been a fantastic uh, discussion. I mean, really wonderful to hear the progress you've made, Brian. My name is Oliver Glanville. I'm, I'm trying to start a biochar company in South Africa. Um, the big question you know, we have, as, as you have, you both explained a lot today, uh, is where that biochar offtake comes, comes from. I was at the South Africa Macadamia Nut Association annual conference last week. <laughs> and uh, Great feedstock, by the way. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but, you know, if the market is not developed, you know, in North America, it's certainly not there at all uh, in, in South Africa. Um, you know, for us, it's a first project, you know, unlikely to look at, you know, debt finance on that, right? Um, just a question, you, you mentioned obviously securing this uh, by jar of take agreement, but you had a sort of seed round, if you like, and before that, maybe some equity. Uh, did you have the biochar offtake in place when you got the equity finance? No, um, n not at all. Um, we, had, uh, we had some interested customers, um, and, and, and you know, part of the economics of this uh, in the water filtration world is, you know, we, we talked, I gave some numbers about what biochar is going for out there when we sell a ton of this material into certain markets that because it has organic removal and metal removal capabilities, et cetera, there are basically three functions that it does. Um, you know, we, we've historically sold that for upwards of $4,000 a ton. So, you know, the, the, the rice guys who are now taking those rice hulls and, and, and paying to have them hauled away got really excited about investing in something that had the potential to take those and turn it into something that was a much higher, um, you know, value product. So, you know, the, that equity, the early equity was easy to do because they were excited about the potential. Now, the problem is that's a market that's very slow to build, um, and ultimately, you know, when we started looking at things that would ramp faster uh, and do offtake agreements, we had a hard time with the water uh, in that water space. People would buy it, but they weren't going to do offtake agreements. So I think, you know, I think you can get that initial financing without the offtake agreement, but to get to that next level, particularly with, you know, what, what we've been through, and it's, and, and poor Will has been, you know, there every step of the way with us, you know, this is, it, it is new technologies, new applications, there's a lot of new here. And so the folks that are coming in who want to do these deals, you know, as they learn more, you know, the goalposts do keep moving. And we, we've certainly felt that for us because we've been trying to raise this, these, these funds now for 18 months. You know, you get to a point where, you know, you think you're there and then, oops, well, wait a minute, we need this and we need that. Or, no, we can't move forward because you need... And so that has led us to a very long process of, you know, of, of trying to find the right players, the right mix of all the things that we need to have in place in order to be able to do this deal. And, we're, you know, knock on wood, we're finally there today where we have all of the pieces in place, but it, it has not been easy. So there's a lot of cautionary tale there about making sure that you line all of that stuff up uh, and think about that today as you're thinking about, well, what's step one and then where do we go beyond the seed round? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're almost up on time. So, Brian, maybe you could uh, close us out with um, what have been the 
big surprises over the last, let's say, 18 months. You could speak to yourself, the Brian Eagles, 18 months ago. What would you say about this financing journey you've been on? As you say, knock on wood, touch wood, it, it, it closes. What surprised you, both positive and negative, on this, on this journey? Um, well, I, I think the, you know, the, the positives for us, and we, we didn't talk about it, but you know, the, the IRA bill has introduced, particularly in these investment tax credits, um, you know, for us in the markets that we're in, um, the opportunity to recapture upwards of 50% of the investment going in. That makes a big difference for the dead guys and other folks that are coming in. So, you know, that was the that that was the big positive that we hadn't really accounted for when we began this journey. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the negative, as I talked earlier, uh, was really just how resistant, um, you know, the, these, uh, and I don't sound like I'm bashing them, but, you know, these, these climate tech funds are. If you want to remove CO2 and greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, you're not going to do it with software. You're going to have to buy machinery that's going to do it. And so, you know, if that's really what your focus is, and that's what you told your LPs when you raised the fund, well, you're going to have to invest in hardware. And it was surprising to me to talk to people that, uh, that amount to several billion dollars in assets who just absolutely will not invest in hardware. And that, that was disappointing, I think, from, from, from my standpoint. Yeah, but to all the guys in software in the room, still very important, don't worry. But. <laughs> you know, software, software is critical. I mean, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time right now looking at the MRV platforms yeah. that we're going to need. These things are critical. It's, it's all part of the mix. Yeah. But, you know, what's missing in the equity yeah. Uh, and particularly for people who say that they're all about removing, you know, uh, and addressing climate tech and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, y you're going to have to buy CapEx hardware. heavy. It's CapEx yeah. heavy CapEx. for finance. That's what you need. Absolutely. That's great. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I've really enjoyed that, Brian. I've really enjoyed working with you as well. And um, look, we're around um, grabbing drinks afterwards. If anyone was interested by what they heard today, please come up and grab us afterwards. We'd love to keep talking. Thank you very much. Well... Thank you and low carbon. Really appreciate the work that you guys have done. Yeah.